Minh Thủy xin kính chào quý vị hôm nay thứ Sáu, 26 tháng 7, 2024. Đến với VATV hôm nay gồm có phỏng vấn đặc biệt và nhạc lá bồ đề. Kính thưa quý vị, vào năm 1966 và năm 1967, có nhiều chiến lược quân sự được đưa ra để kết hợp với các chính sách ngoại giao nhằm đạt được kết quả thỏa đáng. Khi trở về Mỹ trong khoảng thời gian năm 1966 đến năm 1967, thì ông Frank Scotton đã được các bạn thân giới thiệu để cho ông có thể thuyết trình riêng cho Bộ trưởng Lục quân Mỹ. Trong cuộc tiếp xúc đó thì ông Frank Scotton đã đưa ra chiến lược theo cái nhìn riêng của ông. Chiến lược đó khác hẳn với chiến lược rượt bắt mà ông cho là vô hiệu. Trong cuộc gặp gỡ với Bộ trưởng Lục quân thì ông Frank Scotton đã trình bày chẳng những chiến lược quân sự mà còn đưa ra những sự suy nghĩ trên khía cạnh ngoại giao của Mỹ với thế giới và khía cạnh chính trị của Việt Nam trong tiến trình dân chủ. Xin mời quý vị cùng theo dõi những suy nghĩ của ông Frank Scotton trong những năm 1966 đến năm 1967. Đây là thời điểm một năm và hai năm trước Tết Mậu Thân. Tuy không bị chỉ trích, nhưng quan điểm của ông cũng không được áp dụng. Minh Thúy mời quý vị theo dõi cái nhìn của ông Frank Scotton đối với tiến trình Việt Nam và đề nghị của ông về cách can thiệp quân sự của Mỹ qua cái nhìn mà ông gọi là hàng rào người. Trong phần chính phỏng vấn đặc biệt do Phan Lê Dũng, Võ Thành Nhân và Minh Thúy thực hiện. So, would you say the Americanization of the, the war, if it could be called that, was that at the right time? Was that the right decision, or was that just something? Well, that it, it again, it, I had I had a, a falling out. Uh, uh, two two friends of mine, uh, uh, Jack Galvin, who later became the NATO commander, and uh, much later, and uh, uh, Jack Gibney. Um, who worked with me on a couple of projects? They knew in in uh, '66, '67, uh, I think it was when I was I was going back to uh, Washington at one point, and uh, I guess it was in '67, and they arranged for me to see the uh, Secretary of the Army. At the time, uh, uh, Gibney had been a classmate at West Point of uh, Jack Galvin, and Galvin was the military assistant to the Secretary of the Army. So I, uh, you know, they provided me with an opportunity, and I went in there, and I'd already tried to make the case in Saigon um, to no avail, and I, I, with the Secretary of the Army, Stan Rezor, who was a World War II veteran, um, I, I tried to make the case for uh, creating a barrier, a, a human barrier, using the American forces from Lao Bao on the Lao border with Quang Tri uh, across to Savannah Ket on the Mekong, and uh, not not allowing uh, not allowing any anything from the north to come south. And uh, uh, Secretary Rezor listened uh, politely, and I said that the world would yell and scream, particularly who's sympathetic to the communists, um, and we would have to make the case that, uh, fine, uh, replace us with a United Nations peacekeeping force, but isolate the North from the, uh, isolate the, North from the South. And I told him that if we do if we do not isolate the North from the South, then uh, we will eventually lose. Because the, I said you you have to understand the government of North Vietnam is not a government of North Vietnamese. It's a government of Central Vietnamese, one prominent North Vietnamese, but who, by our source, uh, has already married a Southerner at that time. Um, and his, and his, his life has been spent 
in, in the war against the French and now the war against the government of South Vietnam in the South. So you're not talking about a, uh, a North Vietnamese government, you're talking about, a, a, you might almost say, a Central Vietnamese government that's trying to unify the country. So I said, you, if, if we do not isolate the North from the South uh, and accept the yelling and screaming that will happen until the UN can replace us, we can't, we can't win this because um, Americans will get tired. We got tired in Korea. We got tired in other places. We, you know, so, so you're arguing for somewhere in the middle, not exactly intervention, but not exactly withdrawal. Also, it's just yeah, introducing. No, I, that, yeah, I didn't. I didn't see us as intervening in the north. No. You know, let, uh, my no, feeling no. was let the north be the north, but don't let the north take over the. the don't let central Vietnamese communists mm -hmm. take over the south. Yes, and make it a and make it a, a, a unified. That's why I say a, that a country. You, you're recommending the course yeah. of uh, just prevention. Yeah, I, prevention. I, I, so, so that have that barrier, and I said then, just as in Korea, it took decades, but you have time for representative government to evolve. That will happen in South Vietnam too, but you have to preserve a distinct South Vietnam identity, and the way to do that is. A barrier, but if we don't do that barrier, I don't see us. Uh, do you see winning. the barrier as the same thing as the American eyes of the war that the American did? Except uh, they don't establish that barrier, but they still put that much of American there. Would, would the barrier take, still take the same amount of soldier coming to Vietnam like that? Oh, it might have taken less. Might it, have taken it less. Might have, it might have taken less because the the, the problem with the presence in oh there were a lot of problems with respect to the presence of American forces in the South, but one of them was that you had to, you had to sprinkle them uh, countrywide. And there was this game that children used to play called whack-a-mole. You know, well, you were playing whack-a-mole countrywide, but as you were playing whack-a-mole, you were also killing a lot of South Vietnamese innocently. I mean, the conduct of the Ninth Division in the Mekong Delta area, and what it meant in terms of civilian casualties, civilian displacements, was so great that that was the first division chosen by MACV to be withdrawn. Uh, John Paul Van referred to the Ninth as the as the bloody Ninth American division. Yeah, you're talking about John Paul Van. Tell us more about him and uh, how's your uh, contact with him. And, uh, what's your impression of his performance and things well, like that? Well, um, again, my introduction to him was was uh, via Ev Bumgardner um, and Rufus Phillips, um, and uh, I thought of him as a uh, when, I, when I first met him as a as a cocky, boastful, pushy, uh, arrogant kind of guy. Um, but uh, but I came to be impressed by his his commitment, his his activity, um, his range of uh, friendships and contacts, and uh, uh, you know I th I think he was I think it was okay and I. I was with him. I don't know if I put it in the book or not, but I was with him once. I, when he went transferred to two corps, uh, Colby allowed me to go up and spend a couple of weeks kind of helping ad him adjust to the difference between the Mekong Delta and two corps. And uh, at one point, there had been an outpost overrun near Cheo Rail in Fubon province. And uh, we went down there in his helicopter, piloted by Warren Officer Richards, and we found a surviving uh, regional forces soldier, badly wounded. So uh, I got in the in the back of the little Loach helicopter, and and Van lifted the guy in and kind of astride my astride me, and we headed back up to Pleiku to get to the hospital. Well, uh, en route. Um, sometime before we touched down, uh, that regional forces soldier died as I was holding him. And when we landed uh, and Van walked around, I, 
I said, he's gone. Uh, and Van went over to the tail of, of the, towards the thing. I mean, I was afraid he might walk into the rotor, but he, he didn't get that far, but he just went towards the tail, and then he started pounding, you know, on the thing and saying, five minutes, 10 minutes, we could have saved that little guy's life. You know, and he, for the moment, more than anything else in the world, that's what mattered to him, is he tried to save the guy and the guy died. So Van was a, I would say, a kind of an exotic uh, guy, but, uh, you know, definitely committed, and I, uh, I, I liked him. Do you feel like he worked well with American and American understand him more than the Vietnamese? Uh, kind of, because you know, what you were saying in the beginning about his being bombastic and uh, arrogant and all that, does that make any uh, impact on the Vietnamese with whom he uh, worked? I, I, think that the, I think the Vietnamese had understood his, his degree of commitment, the totality of his commitment. Uh, they overlooked uh, his weakness, his, his uh, extreme personality in some ways. Um, I think um, I think uh, I, I think that Van is one of those people that you either liked him or you didn't like him. You know, I, I liked him for what I saw that within him that uh, made it possible for him to get th some things done. Uh, Mời quý vị đón xem phần 10 phỏng vấn ông Frank Scotton, nhân viên cao cấp Sở Ngoại vụ Hoa Kỳ, sẽ được phát hình vào tối thứ Sáu ngày 2 tháng 8, 2024. Kính thưa quý vị, chương trình VATV đến đây xin tạm ngưng. Chúng tôi sẽ tiếp tục phần 2 sau phần thông báo và quảng cáo.